Hello, everybody. It is Thursday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, Assistant Sports Editor for Multimedia at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Back with Seth Engel for our weekly Penn State football podcast. Heading into the blue-white game, Seth, uh, lots of, a lot of storylines we're finally going to get to see play out in a in a live game. I don't know if a real game is, is the correct word for, for what's about to go down in um, Beaver Stadium this weekend. But, you know, we got some things to chew on, which is a lot better than, than what we've been sitting on for, for most of the winter in this early spring period here. Um, how excited are you for? Well, I guess it's, it's going to be your last trip into Beaver Stadium as a, as a student on um, Saturday afternoon. Yeah, I mean it was kind of weird leaving the practice facility, um, thinking you know this is my last real I guess practice session um, as a student. You know we'll see what happens in the future, but um, you know a bit bittersweet. But you know still there's a bunch of stuff to talk about, and um, you know this game should be kind of interesting. You know James explained the format of it where. Um, it's going to be basically two kind of evenly sided teams in terms in terms of talent. Um, so that way they can actually kind of do a real game with it, um, which, you know, a couple of years ago, considering they were so depleted at offensive line, um, you know, they weren't able to do. So it should be fun. It should be interesting. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. We're going to get into the various storylines to keep an eye on, and there's a lot of them. I'm, I'm going to start with the most important position on the field, Seth. It's quarterback. Um, there's some intrigue. At, at, I think with you know how is Drew Aller going to look different? How some of these other guys are going to look um, with their reps? Because you know it's become less rare that you get to see the number two quarterback during the season. Penn State's found ways to get Drew Aller involved, Bo Pribula involved the last couple of years. But still, this this tends to be one of the best looks you're going to get at some of these guys further down the depth chart. Let's start with Drew. Um, what are you looking to see from him specifically? I, I think it's it's difficult, given that this is basically a glorified stri- scrimmage, to expect him to show a whole lot. Is, is it is it mentality change? Is is that what you're looking for from him? And and some of what we've been talking about on this podcast the last couple of weeks, in, in terms of him taking command, being more vocal. Um, seeing that play out on the field a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's only you can only see so much from the spring game. Like I think it was last year, um, or maybe it was two years ago when he got his first kind of reps. Um, I think he threw a pick on his first pass attempt, which you know, if that that's not at all telling of you know kind of the true Aller that we saw last year. I mean, obviously there were struggles throwing interceptions. Um, was was never a problem for him, um, you know. One of the one of the best ratios in the country. Uh, but the thing that I'm kind of looking from from him is um, that comfortability that that he's talked about um, under Andy Kotelnicki, and you know his ability to kind of just be himself and have fun out there and play free. Um, we really didn't see that last year, and I'm hoping you know to see in a low pressure situation on Saturday. Um, that he's really able to kind of be himself um, and just have fun and just play football. Um, and, and it would be the same thing for Bo as well. In terms of the the number two guys, and further down the depth chart, is is there pressure on Bo Pribula in this game to, to show out a little bit? Obviously, Grunkemeyer's on campus. He's, he's shown some things that have people excited. We know they like Jackson Smolik in, in that room too. Unfortunately for, for Penn State, he's hurt. And, and we're probably not going to see him this weekend. But um, does Bo Pribula have to remind people why that they were so excited about him during the fall with, with so much competition coming up? I, I think Bo just fits so well in this Andy Kotelnicki system, um, which has, you know, consistently had two quarterbacks, you know, play pretty significant um, rep counts. So for him as a backup who – you know, had like seven touchdowns last year and, and played in basically every game, um, that's big time. You know, so to see Bo's role um, in this new offense, which really emphasizes playing two quarterbacks, um, I'm really excited for. And we talked to Bo earlier today, and um, he said that it's been great to, to kind of fit into that system and that it's really just been um, a really ideal situation for him. So to kind of see how, you know, this new system not only affects Drew Aller, um, but also impacts the way that that Bo Prabula can kind of make an impact. Uh, I think I think is really exciting, and that's something that we're really going to get to see um, for I think the first time on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. I, I, he listen. I I have th- made no secret of of my fandom of here. It's, it's not like a I'm not picking between the two. I, I think 
Drew Aller is, um, you know, great for some reasons, but I, I just, I always see a little bit of Trace McSorley in Valper Buell. And I think that's a, a swagger that this Penn State program has been missing at times, um, you know, since, since you, you lost Trace McSorley. And that's, that's not a slight on Sean Clifford, it's not a slight on Drew Aller. It's just something that, that Trace McSorley had that you miss a little bit. So I, I'd love to see him have a, a little bit more of a regular role. Um, you mentioned that call with, with Bo. Were there any other highlights that you wanted to bring up and um, kind of what the vibe check is going into this game for him? Yeah, I mean, he did talk a little bit about the receivers, and I know we're going to talk about them down the road. Uh, but just saying, you know, as we've kind of heard from other coaches, you know, this is this has been a pretty good spring for them. Uh, you know, seeing them working hard and obviously that leadership um, has kind of sensed a shift in the room. Um, we'll see how that play how that plays out. You know, it's not like these players and coaches are going to diss the room, as we've discussed before. If someone asks them about the receivers, probably going to say good things about them. So we'll see if that's legitimate on Saturday. Um, another note that I wanted to, to mention, um, and you touched on it a bit, you know, obviously Jackson Smolak um, with a significant injury, as James Franklin said last night, um, you know, I hope, you know, he's able to, to recover from that pretty quickly and um, that everything's okay there. But um, Ethan Grunkemeyer, who's a true freshman early enrollee, he's now stepping into his shoes as, as that third string. That's a guy we've heard, you know, some really good things about um, so far this spring. And um, whether he's actually able to show that on the field on Saturday, I think should be really telling um, of, of Penn State's future plans at quarterback. You know, this goes back to what we discussed last week with with missing out on, on Matt Zollers. Um, if Gronk is able to be that guy, the, the quarterback of the future, you know, we'll have the first opportunity to really see what he's capable of on Saturday. Yeah, and I think that's it's just going to be fascinating to, to see how that plays out between those guys. Not because I don't think – I think Pope Rule is going to be the number two quarterback. I don't think there's a whole lot of debate about that. But, you know, if things go the way of Penn State wants this season and, and Drew Aller plays well enough to play himself into a top NFL draft position, he's gone, and you're talking about what they're doing in 2025 – um, you know, that's where I wonder if Bo Pagula is, is vulnerable in the big picture, what happens after Drew Aller's situation. Right. That's why I look at, at a game like this. It does have some stake for those guys. It's, it's not everything. It's not maybe a, a huge piece, but it is what we have in front of us to react to. So um, definitely something to watch for there with the quarterbacks. You mentioned the receivers. Let's get into them briefly. Um, what are the important things that you want to see from that group uh, going into this game? Um, Keandre Lambert Smith is a guy that we did not see much down the stretch. Um, I'm curious to see how that situation unfolds with him. Um, is, is it Trey Wallace showing some signs of consistency? I think we've shown he's shown flashes for, for being able to be a consistent number two or number three type of guy, but um, I don't know that we really saw it with, with a whole lot of regularity last season. And then you and I have talked a lot about some of those guys further down the, the depth chart Amari Evans, Liam Clifford, Caden Saunders. Um, What's on what's on your radar going into this this game, Seth? Oh, I forgot to mention too, Julian Fleming. By the way, the, the big the big headliner of this group is going to be play, playing his first game in a Penn State uniform. Um, I, I guess just react to to you know what's what's on on your mind going into this game for for that position group. Yeah, we'll we'll start with some of the returnees. Um, Keandre Lambert Smith is someone I guess to look for to see if he even plays because we didn't see him at practice yesterday um, for whatever reason. Didn't see Kate on Allen either. Um, you know, whether that's an injury or what. Um, but, you know, if he does play, you know, you, you got to look for him. You know, we've we've heard some good things and um, heard some exciting talk from Franklin a couple weeks ago about him. Um, so if he's able to kind of follow that up with a good performance on Saturday, I think I think could be very telling. But um, you mentioned Trey Wallace is a guy you know, who's banged up a lot last year, was supposed to be, you know, potentially Penn State's leading target. Um, but you know, it was, it was injured for most of the season, you know, comes back, plays in the peach bowl has, you know, 73 receiving yards and a touchdown does really well, um, to see him kind of carry that into this next year, um, and really become the wide receiver that I think a lot of people expected he was going to be last year. I think, I think that's going to be interesting to watch on Saturday and, you know, how as, as his chemistry has kind of improved with Drew Aller over the course of the year. Um, something to watch for. And then obviously Julian Fleming, probably the most, um, you know, enticing and, and exciting piece in that wide receiver room right now. Um, big year for him, you know, considering all the injuries he's had in the past, this is the year that he wants to show people. I am, you know, Julian Fleming, the number one player in Pennsylvania out of high school. 
number one wide receiver in the country. Um, and, and, and he thinks he deserves a shot in the NFL. So this will be the first step in, you know, having a good performance, but also, you know, staying healthy through some, uh, some, some real kind of, you know, pads and helmet scrimmages. And, um, and, you know, if he's able to kind of work through that and find some success in that offense. Are there any guys further down that depth chart, Seth, that, that you have real hope for coming coming out of what you've heard this spring? Because um, you and I have had conversations here in the past about, man, they just need a little bit more depth. They need guys who who can, you know, maybe not be an every down type of receiver, but but you know, pull a Saeed Blacknall in the Big Ten championship game and just go off. Um, are you getting any vibes from anybody other than the guys we've already talked about that that they're going to take a step this season as well? Yeah, it's funny. I'm like creating this name for like that other group of receivers because James Franklin keeps talking about, you know, separating themselves from the pack. It's like that's the group of like the we need a sep- we need someone to separate themselves from the pack. Like they're all basically on the same level of just kind of there, you know, waiting for someone to really step up. Um, some names have jumped out. You know, I could go down the list like Amari Evans, Liam Clifford, Malik McLean. Like those are probably the three that are, you know, we're just waiting for someone right now. And I do think Amari Evans probably has, oh, and then Caden Saunders as well adds to that list. I think Amari Evans does have, you know, a ton of upside, um, just really lost a lot of burst last year. It was always his speed was was number one in his top calling card, and we just did not really see that from him, you know, maybe at times, but for most of the year, not really. Um, Caden Saunders, I think, has a ton of potential. You know, that could be fun next year. Um, it was interesting to kind of see him you know, excel, I guess, late in the year and, you know, get some work on special teams. Um, he'll also probably be the primary punt returner. Um, and then, you know, some other guys like Liam Clifford, Malik McLean, just like doing more things on a consistent basis, I guess, is is kind of what you can look at them for, uh, for on Saturday. Seth, I know you finally got a chance to talk to AJ Harris. I think cornerback is a position a lot of people are going to be watching based on on what happened in the in the Peach Bowl and the way Ole Miss tore up what Penn State has coming back. Um, what what did AJ Harris have to say? I guess first of all, and second of all, how, you know what are, what's your read on on how that position group has has fared in spring practice? Yeah, AJ was you know he was a treat to talk to last night. He is just a I guess you could call him giddy in a way. You know he's. I think he was smiling the entire time. It seemed like he was just happy to be there. Um, you know, a young kid who, you know, he's he was only a freshman last year and actually burnt his red shirt at Georgia in a loaded secondary, which is, you know, pretty remarkable. Um, now coming to Penn State, definitely needs his help, needs him to step up. Um, you know, I think he's an exciting player. And he really harped on his aggressiveness and – you know, his kind of his play style is just the guy who's going to go out there with a ton of tenacity um, and just play hard. Um, but it seems like he's really acclimated himself with the rest of that room. You know, Jalen Kimbers, another SEC transfer who came from Florida, um, you know, heard some good things about him. You know, he's, you know, a fifth year. He's got a ton more experience than A.J. Harris does, which is probably much needed in that young room um, that boasts, you know, potential. And, and Cam Miller – Zion Tracy and Elliot Washington just really need to see, um, you know, those guys kind of work and, 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 you know, put in the numbers that we did not see in the Peach Bowl. Um, but, you know, you talk about, you know, maybe a lack of talent in the receiving room. Um, interesting to see maybe how that looks for the cornerback room. And it, it's like they're not facing all these great receivers like they had to face at Ole Miss. So, um, you know, take everything with a grain of salt on Saturday. Do you think uh, people are overlooking Jalen Kimber a little bit? I know he's someone we talked a, a little bit about last week. It, it seemed like you, you're a little bit higher on him than I think the, the fan base at large might be. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a – I'm not sure if he's going to start right away, but I think, you know, at, at the very best, like he's a – at the very least, he's, he's, a, he's a depth piece and he's a veteran in the room um, who I think has, you know, been a hard worker and kind of just – knows how it's done. You know, he's been at Georgia, he's been at Florida, um, and now he's kind of able to be another voice in that room that I think really lacks, you know, not necessarily leadership, but veteran leadership, which I think is um, is a valuable thing to have there, especially, you know, when you've had guys like Kalen King and Johnny Dixon and Daquan Hardy, who are these real veteran kind of presences, 
for them to leave, you know, you got to have some people with experience in there. And I do think Jalen Kimber at the very least, you know, fills those shoes. Yeah. It should be interesting to see, you know, how much we can see of him on Saturday. Seth, we talked a little bit about the the safeties and, and some of the stuff t- Tom Allen's trying to do to get them on the field. Do you think we're going to see some of these more exotic, uh, maybe three safety looks on Saturday? Or do you think that's something Tom Allen's going to want to keep under wraps to some degree until um, the season starts? I mean, it's already been kind of publicized. And um, it's not like Penn State hasn't been running, you know, nickel packages in the past. Um, that's kind of what it's going to look like. It'll just be... You know, probably, a, I guess Jalen Reed is more of a bigger body than Daquan Hardy ever was. Um, but just like an in-the-box type of guy um, who, who I think is, you know, that'll that'll be really fun to see. And, you know, what we've heard about, you know, Zaki Wheatley and K.J. Winston this offseason, for them two to be paired with Jalen Reed playing the lion role all at the same time, you know, that should be fun. That should be really fun. And, um, you know, we've heard great things about all of them and, um, I, I think that could be, you know, a major component of this Tom Allen defense next year. Seth, let's talk a little bit about Abdul Carter, obviously making the the switch to defensive end. Um, how much do you think he can actually show in a game like this, considering, you know, we can't hit the quarterbacks in the spring game. We're not going to be seeing any um, big hits. We're not going to be seeing, I think, a ton of, of splash potential from him just because of the, the nature of this being a scrimmage. Um do, do you think that, that we're going to be able to look at him and say, hey, that, that's impressive, or or is this just not the the correct stage for that um, evaluation to be made? Yeah, I mean, he can't necessarily hit the quarterback, but you can see how he works on the defensive line, which we really haven't seen before, um, which is a huge part of it. You know, whether you're able to get past, you know, offensive linemen on a consistent basis and um, how you're able to do that, it's very different when you have a lot more room when you're in the middle um, as a linebacker. Um, so to see kind of how he works with his, you know, his footwork and his hands, um, it's a completely different game over there. Uh, but from what we've heard, you know, the transition has gone really well. James Franklin talked about that last night a little bit. Um, so to see that actually play out, you know, in person in a game, you know, I, I know he can't hit the quarterbacks, but, you know, to see how he's able to kind of just handle that new spot on the field um, should be interesting. And, you know, also deny Dennis Sutton opposite him. You know, both of these guys stepping up for for Chop Robinson and Adisa Isaac, you know, kind of how they work together and feed off of each other, um, I, I think should be, you know, very exciting to watch. Anything else you're watching, Seth? I know there's some competition on the offensive line, um, so that'll be interesting to see how they, they mix and match guys there. Anything else that, that you're watching? Yeah, I mean, the offensive line competition should be huge, um, especially when you're considering – you know, the, that that stacked defensive end room now with, with Abdul coming in. Um, you know, basically there are three open spots on the O-line. I think the two guard spots are the only ones that are kind of locked up right now. Um, you know, right tackle, you know, maybe Nolan Rucci. You know, we're not sure. It'll be cool to see him play a little bit. And left tackle will probably be Drew Shelton to start the year, but he's hurt right now. So not expecting to see him play on Saturday probably going to be Javen Williams kind of manning that spot um, at left tackle. And then center is um, still a competition right now between Nick Dawkins and a true freshman and Cooper Cousins. Um, So to see Cousins get reps at center as a true freshman is, uh, I mean, it's odd. It's very odd that that a guy is that young is fighting for a starting spot on the O-line, especially at that type of position. Um, But, you know, all these competitions all playing out at the same time in person. Um, definitely something to look for. Seth, a um, little bit of uh, some other talk other than the game itself. Parker Fleming is a big college football data science guy. He did his um, Big Ten, projected Big Ten win totals for 2024. He had Oregon number one in the Big Ten at 10.3 projected wins. Penn State number two at 10.1. Then percentage points ahead of Ohio State, which also was at 10.1. Um, projected wins. Michigan a distant fourth at 8.69. Does that sound right to you at this stage, Seth? Is that a little too bullish on on Penn State, given some of the question marks that you and I have spent months talking about? You know, um, it it jumped off the page to me a little bit, I will say. I I definitely would have thought that the the offseason Ohio State ended up having the Penn State would be behind them when you get into the analytics and and that type of thing. So it, it was jarring to see them 
ahead of Ohio State in any kind of projection, Seth. It's it's rare that, that you see that. And it's, it's yeah, Penn State's always been in maybe that two, three range, but to see them finally ahead of Ohio State by even the slimmest of margins was notable to me. Yeah, I think that kind of projection, um, I mean, I don't know what kind of goes into their analytics, but um, probably projecting that Drew Aller is going to figure it out, you know, one way or another. Um, and I do think that protecting the football the way he did last year is important, um, not to give that away, but to figure that out and, and maybe sense an improvement with the wide receiver room. You know, I, I think Penn State could have been a potential playoff team next year if the receiving core was just even the slightest bit better. Um, you know, the defense was great, and I think that'll continue this year. Um, but also, um, you know, I know Ohio State had a, probably a better offseason in terms of, you know, bringing players in and, and really owning the transfer portal. Um, but Penn State's new OC is, you know, one of the top offensive minds in the country. Um, so seeing how that kind of impacts that whole side of the ball. Um, I know Ohio State now is Chip Kelly too, but, um, you know, it'll it's kind of a transition year for them in a way. You know, Ryan Day stepping back from play calling duties and someone else coming in. Um, we're not really sure how it's going to shape up. So, um, but yeah, and I, I like Oregon as that top team there. You know, Dylan Gabriel as a, you know, a major thread. And um, I, I think Oregon's going to be a really tough team to beat next year. Well, that does lead well into my next question, Seth, which is that Penn State avoids Oregon this season. Um, they, they avoid Michigan as well. They get Ohio State at home. Meanwhile, Ohio State has to play Penn State, Oregon, and Michigan. Oregon has to play Ohio State and Michigan. Is this one of the better setups Penn State's had to make a, a, a run at the Big Ten title game um, and not having to get past Ohio State and Michigan necessarily? Well, they're going to have to get by one of them technically. Right. They don't have to beat both of them to get there. Um, they don't have to beat Oregon to get there. Are you looking at Penn State as, as maybe the the betting favorite to get that number two slot? Because remember, there's no more divisions in the Big Ten. Um, after tiebreakers and, and things, they're going to determine just who are the two best teams in the Big Ten to then send them to Indianapolis to play. I kind of look at, at Penn State as having a bit of a, a you know, outside pole position, you know, to, to use a racing term. Um now, whether they can win the Big Ten championship game, I think, is a different conversation. But um, they they do just seem to have the best setup to at least get there. Yeah. I, I mean, Ohio State probably will be the toughest team they'll play this year. Um, you look at the other teams, you know, the other, I guess, Pac-12 opponents that they'd be playing. Um, USC, major transition, you know, losing Caleb Williams. That defense, you know, was terrible last year. Um, I don't think they're just going to find it right away. Um, and really be able to keep up with with the rest of the Big Ten defenses. Um, UCLA, you know, losing Chip Kelly. It's not like they were that great with him there anyway. Um, and then Washington, you know, a complete, you know, overhaul of, of everything. Um, so, you know, it's really just kind of getting by that Ohio State game. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it would be really interesting to see if Penn State is able to, you know, get out of this kind of stacked new Big Ten schedule with, like, one loss, you know, now that they're, you know, not having to play Michigan and Ohio State every year, um, you know, I think I think Penn State could do some damage just based on the way that their schedule kind of shapes up. Um, other teams, you know, not so much, but it all even out in the end. Yeah, yeah, that's why I think I think one loss has got to be the goal, Seth. Uh, even though you know, Penn State has lots of questions and, and none of these games are going to be gimmies, I think you have to look at it and say. Can, if you beat Ohio State, I think you're you're you know no matter who you lose to, just because of the way the tiebreakers work, you should be in good shape, um, even if you slip up once. But I think the ideal is is you you take care of business against all those other teams, so that the Ohio State game doesn't really matter uh, in terms of you getting to the Big Ten championship game, and, and hope that that those other teams all beat up on each other, deal out some losses to each other, and, and then that puts Penn State in a good position. So. Um, yeah, I think you got to feel good about just the setup. Even even if you're not quite sure about the team yet, just the way things are, are set up for them this year feels different than than what we've been dealing with for the last five six years. And Penn State just not being quite good enough to get over the hump and beat both Ohio State and Michigan in that big old Big Ten East. Uh, Seth, any final thoughts before we sign off here? I think that's about it for me. Yeah, I'm I'm just looking forward to Saturday and uh, kind of seeing the, this team's kind of first steps. Um, into a brand new conference and a brand new era of college football. 
it's all very exciting. I mean, it's weird to think that we're just talking so nonchalantly about um, just the way this, the setup of, the, of this next season, you know, 10 years ago, even five years ago, I don't think we could possibly have imagined that, that, that this was going to be the world of college football that we'd be um, discussing. And it, it's a real thing and it's really exciting. And, um, you know, I'm just looking forward to seeing how this all plays out. Yeah, it's exciting, and Seth. I just uh, I just got an Xbox the other day for my for my <laughs> birthday. Get me, get me I, I, I can't wait for that NCAA football game to come out this summer. Get me fired up for this new era as well. So, um, yeah, lots to look forward to, and and hopefully we'll be right back here next week reacting to um, some encouraging news um, and maybe some discouraging news. Who knows? We'll we'll see how things play out on Saturday. But we will be back next week. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Help us out in the YouTube algorithm. And we'll talk to you again real soon. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com.